Hey everyone, this week we're doing something slightly different. Instead of looking at one camera, we're going to look at five. With the price of Colt compact cameras continuing to rise, I thought we could look at five 1980s autofocus compacts that you can still get for a cheap price. First up, we're looking at what's probably the cheapest in this lineup, which is the Pentax Sport DX. Now this camera was released in 1984, uh, really at the birth of the autofocus age. And it's a, a really chunky sort of poster child of 80s camera design, I suppose you could say. But at the heart of it, it's actually quite a nice little camera uh, and I'll explain why. This camera comes with a 35 3.5 lens uh, that's hidden behind this little cover here. Now this lens is very sharp, like surprisingly sharp. If you're a, a fan of Pentax, you'll know that Pentax optics were always really, really good for their SLRs or their compact cameras. Well, the, the Sport DX is, is no different. I've been very impressed with the color rendition and the sharpness uh, from this little camera. Um, it's in this sort of very chunky blue-gray body. Um, it sort of sets it apart from a lot of the 80s compacts uh, that tended to be a variation on black. This camera is very easy to use. Uh, it's an autofocus camera, so it was designed for people who, who just wanted to pick up a camera, point and shoot. The nice thing about this camera is, uh, compared to a lot of 1980s compacts, the uh, motorized wind-on is actually not too loud. It's probably louder than uh, some of the cult cameras from the 2000s or the 1990s, especially the very expensive ones, but it's certainly nowhere near as loud as a lot of its contemporaries. This is a really good compact camera for those who sort of dipping their toes into film uh, for a few reasons. Um, it's very easy to use no lens cover to, to lose, you just have this little switch, camera's ready to go. It runs off a, a pair of AA batteries, which you can find anywhere, grocery stores, supermarkets, chemists. Uh, it's got a manually operated flash, so if you don't want to use flash, you don't have to. It also has manually selectable film ISO, so for instance if you wanted to put a roll of 400 speed film and shoot it at 1000, uh, low light, night time, then you can do that. It's uh, just moving this selector switch here. So that's a bit more flexible than the cameras which read the film speed off the DX coding. Often you couldn't override those. And that is you know, pretty much all you have with this camera. Uh, it's got a rewind on the bottom, so you flick this up and here for the change in the tone when basically the, the film was rewound into the cassette, then you can open the camera. It's got a, an exposure lock here, so you can uh, take a reading off one part of the frame perhaps and then recompose with that switch held down and you'll get a, a properly exposed picture which is, again, just that little bit of creative control that a lot of its contemporaries just didn't allow you to have. It's got a very easy loading system, uh, this sort of bar which holds on tight to the film. So that's, again, easy to load. It stops there being any issues about, you know, the film not loading and you, you know, getting to the end of the frame and there being no Okay, that's probably the noisiest uh, part of the film operation is closing the back and the film being wound on to the first frame. Again, it's the kind of camera which does this automatically. There is one little issue with these cameras and I've owned a few of these. Um, the first one I was given by the lovely folk at uh, Greenwich Cameras as a Christmas present a few years ago. Now it still works, but uh, it has an issue with the battery compartment. The tab which closes the battery compartment is kind of fragile and it's very easy to crack off. Um, with those cameras, simply a bit of Gorilla Tape, masking tape, 
over the battery compartment, keeps it closed and keeps the camera operating. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a design flaw, but it's very easy to, to fix. While this camera might not be as well specified or as pleasing to look at as something like a Contax T2, uh, there is the question of price. And I've never seen one of these cameras sell for more than about 19 pounds. Uh, this one cost me 19 pounds. Uh, another one I got uh, earlier in the year cost me 10 pounds in working condition. Like a few of the cameras that we're looking at today, these seem to be flying under the radar. They're not getting the exposure or the interest uh, compared to some of the better known cameras. And as I found, that's nothing to do with the quality of pictures they take. It's just they haven't been discovered yet. So this camera is what I consider one of the really undervalued Colt compacts uh, that still hasn't really been discovered yet. This is the Ricoh FF9. It's a great minimalist style compact camera from the late 1980s made by Ricoh, who made a whole family of compact cameras uh, under the FF family name. So this one uh, dates from 1988. Uh, Open the little cover here and you turn the camera on. It's got a fantastic little 35mm 3.5 four element lens. And one thing that really surprised me uh, with this lens is how sharp it is for a four element lens. Really pleasing images. The exposure system on this camera is fantastic. You get a wide range of tones um, and great colour rendition. Uh, it's been a real eye-opener just how lovely the pics are from a camera that this one cost me less than £10 a few years ago but they're still £25 on eBay in the UK, a little more from a camera shop but really not a lot of money for what's a, a really interesting capable little camera. One thing with the uh, FF9 is it's, it's got a very clean style uh, it doesn't seem to have many features, but these are actually accessed via this little mode button on the side, and they include some, some really quirky modes that I haven't really seen on other cameras. Now I'm gonna go into a bit more depth about these um, in another video coming up in a few weeks, just on the FF9. Um, but one of these modes is, allows you to uh, take shake-free images of a television screen. Um, you know, this camera obvi obviously dated from the 1980s when we didn't have the sort of video capture tools that we have on laptops and things like that. So yeah, really interesting, quirky little camera. Um, I think it's quite stylish. Uh, some people might say it's a bit ugly. Um, it's got a, a bit of chunk to it, but not over chunky. It still fits in a jacket pocket or you can stick it in a, you know, front pocket of a camera bag. Um, it's got these great little textured parts on the front of the camera and a sort of semi hand grip on the front of the camera which uh, allows you to hold it quite comfortably. Uh, it also has space here for a wrist strap should you want to use one of those. Really the only uh, drawback I've found with this camera is uh, it always wants to put the uh, flash on in uh, lower light like that. Um, but you can actually override it. And nine times out of 10, you're still going to get a uh, properly exposed picture. It's just not gonna have the, uh, the brightness um, that you get with flash. Um, I recently reviewed this camera on Cosmophoto. Uh, so go and have a look at the, the text review. Um, there's loads of example pictures, but uh, we'll also be looking at this camera in a bit more depth in the coming weeks. So here's another camera that I knew nothing about until uh, I first saw it, which was uh, at Greenwich Cameras um, in South London. Uh, it's the Konica MG. It's another compact uh, made in 1984, made by Konica, who uh, made all sorts of cameras from medium format to half frame cameras. Um, and this is a really cool little camera 
uh, compact camera from 1984. Uh, it's got a, a sliding cover, clamshell design, um, looks a bit like the one used on the Mew, but also more like the one that the Olympus XA from a few years before featured. Uh, that keeps the, the lens protected, free from scratches and dust and pocket lint, all that kind of crap. Um, and here you have uh, a 35mm f3.5 lens, um, autofocus obviously. Just like the Pentax Sport that we looked at earlier, this has uh, a manually uh, selectable ISO. Uh, this one goes from 50 right the way up to 1000. So you could pop a roll of Tri-X or HP5 uh, and shoot that at ISO 1000 and low light. Um, that's a really nice feature to have on a compact like this. It, I think it, it gives you a bit more creative control. Uh, another nice feature, um, a bit like the Pentax we looked at earlier, is if you don't want to use the flash, uh, it won't automatically operate it. You have to use this little lever here. That pops the, the flash. If you don't want to use it, just pop it down. I wouldn't call it the smallest compact camera in the world and I definitely wouldn't call it the lightest. It's definitely got some chunk to it, but it feels quite robust. Uh, it's one of those cameras that gives you a little bit of confidence to sort of take it off the beaten track. This camera is powered by double A batteries, um, which are very easy to find, grocery stores, chemists. Um, it also, like the Pentax, gives you the option of mid-roll rewind. Um, so if you want to swap from black and white to color, vice versa, you can just uh, rewind it mid-roll uh, and then load your, your next roll of film in. Uh, drawbacks, it's quite a loud camera, especially the rewind. Um, it took a while for camera makers to work out the issue of the motor wind, the little motor that would um, move your film forward or backwards if you were rewinding. Um, early on they tended to be a bit more powerful and also um, to be quite noisy. So that's something to bear in mind if you were wanting to use this as a, a street camera. There are probably better cameras out there. It's all relative and you might find it's not as loud as some other compact cameras that you might be used to. I'm very pleased with the flash on this, uh, using it at night with parties. Um, it's not too powerful and it, it gives a nice even exposure. Um, if you can find one of these, and I bought this for £25 a few years ago, I still see them being sold in the UK for £30, £35. It's an absolute steal. It's a really nice little camera, um, really impressively sharp lens. Konica are really underrated um, for their compact camera lenses, I think. So if you find one for that kind of price, definitely go for it. So this camera is the Minolta AFC um, from way back in 1983. And this is kind of a halfway house between autofocus and manual cameras like the Lomo LCA or the Olympus XA. It's a really interesting design. Like the Lomo or the Casina CX2, those sort of cult viewfinder cameras, the AFC has a front cover which you move down to get the camera ready for operation. It, it gives it a sort of almost like a 1980s robot look before you slide the cover down. I think it's quite, quite quirky. Uh, and this camera has a really good lens, really sharp. Uh, it's a 35mm like uh, all the cameras we've, we've looked at, but instead of being um, 3.5 at maximum aperture, it's 2.8, which gives you that little bit more room to work with if you're shooting in low light. It's chunky, but also fits in the palm of your hand, almost. Um, and it, it has this sort of halfway house style between autofocus and, and manual cameras. So there's no motorized wind on this camera at all. If you want to advance the frame, you use 
this little thumb wheel just like you would with cameras like the LCA or even a disposable camera. Again, when it comes to rewinding the film, there's no rewind button that, that needs to be activated. It's exactly like in any old film camera. You hold the rewind button on the bottom down and then you rewind manually. So you've got autofocus, which I think is four autofocus zones but you've also got the styling from cameras a generation before. So it's, it's really interesting as a, as a camera design, I think, before you get to the real strength, which is this fantastic lens. The AFC has been a real revelation to me. Um, I've got a lot of compact cameras over the last few years and have been you know, shooting with them as much as possible for reviews for the, the website um, and to, to review for the YouTube channel as well. And this has been one of the best discoveries of the last couple of years. I found this uh, on a website, a Dutch camera seller, I think it was, who was selling it for about 60 euros. Um, it was a little bit more postage, obviously, because it was coming from uh, Netherlands to, to the UK. Uh, but it was worth every penny. And these are probably the most expensive out of the uh, five we're looking at today. Um, prices are sort of nosing around 18, 90, 100 pounds. Um, but I absolutely suggest if you can find one for that price that's working, go for it. It's a very quiet camera. I'll just um, click the shutter button again. Makes it great for street work. It's almost as quiet as cameras like the Olympus XA or the Lomo LCA, which personally I find great for street photography. Um, considering how loud a lot of the autofocus cameras from this period are, this is a, a real secret weapon. Mainly metal frame with some plastic. Uh, the top plate seems to be plastic, but there is this metal frame which keeps the body together. Um, robust, takes the knocks, and when it's sitting on the shelf, looks kind of funky. Just like the Pentax and the Konica, you can set the ISO on this camera manually. So if you want to push process some black and white film or color film, you can do that, pull process. So that's a nice little creative feature of this camera. Um, changing the ISO is using this little thumb wheel down here. It's got a nice resistance to it, uh, a bit like the, the film wind on. So yeah, a good camera to take out at night if you want to take atmospheric shots without having to rely on a flash. Now you'll notice that this camera doesn't have a flash, a bit like the Olympus XA um, Casino CX2. Um, if you wanted uh, a flash, you had to attach it. Not via a hot shoe like the Casino, but via this little attachment here. Um, so there was a accessory flash unit that would screw in here. Um, I don't have that. I'm not somebody who tends to use flash very often, uh, so I can live without it. So the last camera we're looking at today is the, the beast of the mix, the Pentax PC35 AFM. This is one of the first autofocus cameras that Pentax put out. Um, it's uh, an upgrade of an earlier camera, the PC35 AF, that appeared in 1983. Um, and it shares with it this uh, clamshell design, operated with a, a really nice little switch here. Um, it's a great sort of snappy movement, which is just nice to, nice to do. Now, like the Minolta we just looked at, Again, this is a 35mm lens with the maximum widest aperture of f2.8. So again, good for portraits, good for low light, um, getting detail out of the gloom. And not all compact cameras uh, had a lens that went as wide as 2.8. There's another little quirk with this camera. If it feels that there isn't enough light um, for it to take a picture, 
Now I've got this set at 100 ISO because I've got 100 ISO film in here, then it will do this. That's a little warning that, yeah, you can take a picture, but um, there might be camera shake or it might not be exposed properly. Um, that's certainly a bit obtrusive if you're trying to take uh, street photos. So just be aware of that um, if you're wanting to shoot in very dark conditions. So again, uh, this is another camera with some creative control. Uh, you can change the ISO yourself from 100 up to 1000. So if you want to push film, you can definitely do that in this camera. But also has uh, some other really nice features. Again, like the Konica and the Pentax that we looked at earlier, you've got a flash which uh, only operates when you want it to. You have to uh, use this little button on the side. You have a, a self timer, um, which you operate by pulling it out here. There it is there. You also have a really, really nice um, feature for shooting in very bright conditions. Very similar to a feature that the Olympus XA had, and that's a um, backlight compensation uh, button. So what that allows you to do is to shoot with light behind the subject, like uh, a person with a bright sun behind them. And that will actually open up the lens a little bit more and take that reading off the foreground so that your person or object that's in the foreground doesn't become a silhouette because the camera is exposing for the, the very, very bright background. Really nice feature to have. Um, not many compact cameras in this range had them uh, back in the day. I would say that uh, the PC35 AFM is, is definitely feels like a higher spec camera than uh, the ones we were looking at earlier. It seemed to be aimed at photographers who wanted a, a compact rather than an SLR, but wanted that creative control. It's definitely the heaviest of the bunch. This almost has the weight of a, an SLR with a lens attached. It's very chunky. Um, yes, it's plastic, but uh, there's also what feels like quite a bit of metal in here as well. This great textured uh, hand grip, which makes the camera very easy to hold, especially if you don't have the strap that it usually comes with. Um, it's just a really ergonomically pleasing camera to use, um, even if it is a little heavy. It also takes double A batteries, um, those batteries you can find absolutely everywhere. So that's uh, another good point. Um, also good, little film reminder window uh, so that you can check at a glance what you've got loaded in the camera. In my case, I've got a roll of Cosmo Photo Mono. Um, the lens on this is not only fast, it's also incredibly sharp. Um, probably the sharpest of all the cameras uh, we've looked at today. So there's a reason why uh, this Pentax lens is sharp. It's got five elements. Only the Minolta we looked at earlier, which has six elements, uh, is sharper. Um, and I, again, this is one of those cameras, I was recommended this by uh, Anil Mystery, um, who's a, a well-known um, film photographer here in the UK. Um, we were both on a podcast and he was asked what his favorite sort of non-expensive compact was, he mentioned this uh, and said that you could get them for not very much money still. Lo and behold, a few months later, I found myself at a camera fair and I, I found this for 15 pounds. Now, considering the pictures I've got of this are just as sharp as some of my SLR photos, um, I think that's a steal. Um, I bought another of these recently the price has gone up a little bit, um, but we're still talking less than 40 pounds for what's a, a large, heavy, slightly cumbersome, but quite stylish camera. I like the, the fact all the, the buttons that you might need to use are, are finished in red and the strap uh, corresponds with that. There's a bit of love that's gone into this camera. And I really think if you get one, and you shoot it, you're going to be blown away by how great 
the lens on this camera.